Welcome, welcome. I'm Jonathan Friedman, and this is The Common Room, PEN America's conversation series about free speech, diversity, and inclusion in higher education. PEN America's mission is to celebrate creative expression and defend the civil liberties that make it possible. And I invite those of you in attendance today to consider joining our national membership of writers, journalists, scholars, and their allies in support of our mission. Today, we'll be talk tackling a, a topic of immense interest in higher education, state legislators, and academic freedom. I'm joined by Musa Algarbi, Paul F. Lazarsfeld Fellow in the Department of Sociology at Columbia University. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Second, Lindsay Ellis, Senior Reporter at the Chronicle of Higher Education. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having us. Hi, Lindsay. And finally, Jeffrey Sachs, Political Scientist at Acadia, at Acadia University. Thank you very much for having me. So before we be get into the main topic of the hour, all here are reminded that this is a forum for interaction and open dialogue. We ask that everybody speak to one another with respect and remember to mute when not speaking, of course. We'll reserve time at the end for questions from the audience, but all are invited to put comments or questions in the chat throughout the session. So to the topic of the day, since the start of the year, a wave of bills have been introduced by state legislators around the country, taking aim at the ideologies, curricula, and teaching approaches in colleges and universities. Proposals include surveying the political leanings of professors, banning the teaching of divisive concepts and curricular materials from the New York Times 6019 project, as well as limiting the availability of financial aid to certain academic majors. State legislators have made requests to examine concepts and terminology taught in specific classes or have called both publicly and privately for some professors to be terminated for their speech, particularly for their tweets. Some allege the wave of activity is having a chilling effect on professors already, while others say these elected representatives are merely executing their official duties. Let's start with you, Musa, to set the stage. I know you've written numerous op-eds expressing concern for the state of free speech and academic freedom in higher education, particularly for conservative students. Perhaps you've even experienced these challenges personally as an undergraduate and graduate student. Can you tell us a bit about the problem or problems as you've diagnosed them? Yeah, uh, so as I see it, there's sort of a handful of interrelated problems that kind of feed into uh, a lot of these uh, issues that we see. Um, so one of them is uh, self-censorship, uh, self-censorship by faculty, self-censorship by students. On the student side, um, part of what drives it is fear of uh, professors judging them or professors docking their grade because they said, uh, but a, a big part, probably the bigger part actually from some of the survey seems to be concerned from their peers, um, peers judging them, uh, offending their peers, uh, peers not, not wanting to like hang out with them anymore. And, Actually, this is one of the big things that drives faculty self-censorship as well. Um, so, um, because you know, faculty, even if you're not worried about getting fired, uh, so let's say you're a tenured or tenure track professor, you also don't want to be the person who goes in the room and everyone's like, ugh. Like you want to be invited to parties, you want to, you know. Um, so, uh, so even among faculty, uh, faculty who lean conservative, for instance, tend to avoid working on. Um, the kinds of subjects that where their political leanings would be relevant, they tend to try to uh, kind of downplay their right. So there's self censorship among faculty and students. A second problem um, that sort of uh, is that there's this problem of, of ideological homogeneity within the academy. So um, in social research fields, uh, you know, uh, progressive uh, people who are aligned with uh, the left outnumber people aligned with the right by a fact by around ten to one, um, and that's not. And the problem here isn't the isn't some specific number that should be the problem is that when you have when people are too similar when they all agree to the same uh, you know view things in largely the same ways you have it undermines our ability to understand certain phenomena so it, it makes research worse it makes teaching worse it leads to groupthink and um, extremism important questions are never asked or never explored so that's a, a second problem a third problem is. Uh, ideological discrimination. Um, and this is more of a problem the higher you go. So for students, uh, undergrads, they don't really face too much um, ideological discrimination uh, within, you know, from official, like official discrimination. So they have a lot of concerns, for instance, about getting docked in their grades um, for saying the wrong thing, but there's not a lot of evidence that that happens. Um, but as you go higher, 
Um, so for instance, as you're applying to grad schools, discrimination does become a little bit more, but most importantly is when you're uh, going on the job market or when you're a faculty member, that's when the discrimination becomes most pronounced because it's a higher stakes decision. So when a department hires you, you're gonna be around for the foreseeable future. They're gonna be working closely with you. They're gonna be, uh, right. Uh, and, um, and how that plays out is not just in the hiring decision question, um, but then also on other things that are related. So um, there's a lot of research showing that there's ideological discrimination that happens in terms of peer review for journals, in terms of institutional review boards when you're uh, uh, trying to get projects approved, in terms of grants when you're applying for um, funding. Um, and so this ideological discrimination is, is another problem. Um, uh, and then there's the two more. Uh, one is the growing disconnect between institutions of higher learning and the publics that they're supposed to be serving. Um, so a growing number of, uh, a growing share of the public seem, feels um, left behind by institutions of higher learning, disconnected from uh, experts and elite, uh, you know, um, and they don't understand the value of, uh, of certain lines of work, especially um, critical work related to the humanities. They don't understand what the point is, what the value is, why their tax dollars should be funding that work. Um, and that's, um, and that at least part of that problem is, I guess, ours to own in the sense that we could do a better job engaging with the public and making the case for why, you know. Um, uh, and then the last thing I'll note is that there are changes in the structure of higher ed institutions, which feed into a lot of these problems too. Um, and I'll just name a few. Uh, a customer is always right approach that uh, a number of sort of campus leaders have adopted with respect to students, understanding students as customers and the customer being you know, uh, right uh, can lead to problems. Um, professional governance uh, among faculty, uh, like faculty governance is being under, undermined um, in some cases by administrators who have a uh, bigger power and, and, and represent a bigger share of total personnel and universities. Um, there's this adjunctification of the prof professoriate, which is also uh, a very big problem with respect to, uh, you know, academic freedom. And, um, and, and so these, like, uh, five problems, I guess, um, kind of interplay with one another and create this sort of toxic stew we find ourselves in now. Um, and, and um, they're often kind of run together in a lot of these discussions. So when you see some of these bills or you hear conservatives complaining about higher ed, they kind of run together the issues of self-censorship and ideological homogeneity and discrimination, ideological discrimination. But they're actually um, importantly different problems that have different causes, that have different solutions. <laughs> um, so it's, um, they are related, but it's important to kind of pull them apart and to not like run them together. That's a lot. So I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute on the on the question of solutions, and because I think there has been wide varying um, widely varying diagnoses of of the extent of these problems, and I think faculty at different kinds of institutions, students, um, you know, the public in general has had differing perceptions of the extent to which each of these things is truly a problem or not a problem or uh, what it is that should be done about it. But now there's definitely activity being you know, undertaken. And I think that that point you made about the disconnect with the public is really key. Uh, numerous surveys showing that Republicans and conservatives generally uh, uh, no longer really value higher education in the way that they used to. That's quite alarming. Now, I know, Lindsay, you've been tracking closely uh, all of these developments for some time with the Chronicle, uh, reporting in particular on the activities of state legislators, uh, including the introduction of bills that have implications for academic freedom, and other activities by elected officials that appear to put professors, you know, pretty squarely in the crosshairs. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the trends that you've been seeing, um, what's new, what's different in this, you know, as, as people I think are scrambling to try and um, do something about what they view as the problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, good question. Um, so a few years back, I think, the focus on, from a lot of state houses and state senates was on student conduct and how students were responding to speakers that, for example, they didn't agree with politically, what speakers were doing on campus and how and where students were expressing themselves when they wanted to protest or they wanted to hand out flyers and the like. I think what we've seen this year that feels distinct from that and notable is that the focus appears to be on not what's happening in the college campus writ large, but what's happening in the college classroom. 
Um, the legislation that I've been following is, you know, relates to what's on the syllabus, what's part of the course outcomes, um, how professors approach certain topics and, um, you know, topics related to um, oppression and privilege and the like in particular. Um, I think two notable examples to get going um, in our conversation would be one in Arkansas where a bill in the house basically explicitly would bar um, a class that addressed, you know, social justice for any particular group or the oppression of any particular group. Um, and just, you know, that that bill has not passed. It was something that was introduced and sort of got some attention. And then secondarily, an effort in Georgia that um, a lawmaker had basically asked the state's public universities, I think there are 25 or 26 of them, um, you know, how do you teach oppression? How do you teach privilege? And that required, you know, any number of, or every single one of these, you know, more than two dozen campuses to go through their syllabi, look through their course outcomes. And in one case that I, I talked to, um, interview faculty about how they were they were doing this, and so that that places a you know a sharp spotlight on the classroom and um, these concepts and how professors are approaching them. And I think that distinction, you know, on what's happening in class versus what's happening on the quad is probably the thing that's notable over these last few months. So let's bring you in, Jeff. Um, this shift from uh, student conduct to now faculty conduct and things that are being taught. You've been pretty vocal in trying to raise alarms about many of these bills around the country. Um, what do you think of, of these legislative solutions? And you know, if you have thoughts about how we're characterizing the challenges in higher education, you know, and how you see them, those are welcome too. Actually, I really agree with many of the description, the description of the problem that Musa presented. And in particular, I think uh, he's right to highlight the importance of self-censorship, both among faculty and students. And I think as he, he, as he correctly points out, this is principally a peer-driven phenomenon. I, I think that there might be cases um, where students self-censor because they might fear official sanction from administrators or professors, but generally it's because people wanna fit in, they want to uh, you know, look smart or cool or just get along. And that can be very pernicious, especially in an environment like in higher ed, where people are so overwhelmingly, in many cases, of a specific political ideology. It, it can lead to that kind of groupthink. And I think that in many ways, what we're seeing now is an attempt by legislators to address this problem of self-censorship. The problem, though, is that self-censorship is not an issue that lends itself easily to a legislative solution. It's a cultural problem, not really uh, one of institutional design. And uh, what we're seeing here with these law or these bills is uh, kind of a back end way I feel to address self-censorship. So for instance, in much of the rhetoric surrounding some of these bills like in New Hampshire or West Virginia or Arkansas, they're described as ways of creating a space within classrooms where students who don't subscribe to what these legislators describe or refer to as a, a critical race theory point of view or a, uh, a left-wing point of view. It's intended to create a space by regulating that speech where conservative students feel more comfortable expressing themselves. So I think in some ways it's responding to this problem that Musa is describing of self-censorship, a problem that I think um, as, as a fact member myself, I think, I think we should all care about, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's trying to use a tool that's not designed to perform this particular task. The result, I think, and the fear that I have, and the reason why I'm raising this alarm, is uh, it would really deeply limit the ability of many faculty and in, in other places like in Arkansas, um, some students as well, to operate freely and organize and express themselves openly um, in the classroom or elsewhere on campus. Uh, and uh, I think in the the, 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 when we think about how these bills are written and the language they contain, they're often so vague, so poorly written that they lend themselves to all kinds of, um, of uses that uh, might end up uh, limiting or regulating um, all kinds of very, very important speech that we should absolutely want the campus to be host to. Musa, Lindsay, any response? 
Yeah, I mean, um, th that last point uh, Jeff made, well, for one, I, I, two, two things I'll, I'll just say. One, um, wholeheartedly second and agree with um, this point about how a lot of the challenges that, that, that I described there are fundamentally cultural problems and you can't, yeah, and it's very difficult, um, if not impossible, uh, to sort of legislate cultural solutions to cultural problems. Um, okay, and, and, I, and I can talk about that more later maybe, but, um, but I just wanted to uh, underline how much uh, I agree with that. And in fact, I got so distracted by underlining that that I forgot what the other point was. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just look, pass it on. To I mean, there's definitely something I think also particularly, you know, odd in numerous, in numerous bills that we've been talking about here I think it was in in Iowa where one of the Democratic uh, uh, officials who you know was opposing the bill there said you know was talking about just how incredibly ironic it is that a bill that is trying to ban divisive concepts in the classroom and you know put borrowing some of the language from Trump's executive order from last year about barring uh, race and sex stereotyping in classrooms that that is a, a bill that is being called a free speech bill. I think that hypocrisy here, um, as a free speech advocate, as an organization that that fights for free speech, I think what's so alarming is what are going to be, to me, the long-term consequences, you know, not just of the way that these conservatives and Republicans have taken up free speech, but in particular the way that the things that they're doing that so clearly are at odds with those principles. Yeah, and one thing that they should also be concerned about, um, and I've noted this in other articles, uh, and, and Jeff noted this uh, as well, is that um, once you have something on the books, you know, it can be used for a lot of purposes that you didn't necessarily intend. Um, and, and this is something that conservative students should be. Uh, so for instance, when Trump tried to do this executive, uh, when Trump uh, did this executive order on, on campus speech, uh, one of the things I warned about in an article I wrote in the Washington Post afterwards is that when you set this precedent where um, you can basically defund schools who are who are insufficiently um, uh, who are who who you've evaluated by whatever means to, to as insufficiently um, protective of free speech, that same kind of law could be used to, for instance, um, defund Liberty University, you know, prevent Liberty University from or or other religion or religious institutions. Um, who who uh, try to preserve, um, you know, uh, in principle, in a, in a world where you had a, sort of a democratic trifecta over the government and they were aggressive and wanting to kind of get rid of these kinds of institutions, they could in principle rely on similar um, kinds of arguments with those laws on the books to, to, um, to defund those. Um, and, and, and we see this with a bunch of with speech laws um, in a range of issues. So, so for instance, uh, a lot of laws that were intended to ban hate speech um, somet sometimes disproportionately affect and even primarily affect the very people who they're supposed to be defending. So, you know, people from historically marginalized or disadvantaged groups, African Americans, et cetera, um, have been, you know, uh, censored and, and, and things like this in the name of laws that were passed to prevent hate speech. And in fact, some of the hate speech laws that are um, that were created are already used, for instance, to silence criticisms of Israel and to, 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 to try to apply the rules to um, silence uh, BDS uh, movements on campus. Um, Trump, this is an, a thing that happened under the Trump administration is they tried to apply existing rules um, regarding hate speech in a, in a way that would make it much more difficult um, for a sort of uh, um, perceived anti-Israel speech for, for that to be interpreted as hate speech as anti-Semitism. Uh, and, and so this is one of the problems with getting these laws on the books is they, they, they can be used for a lot of purposes other than the ones you intend. And, and John, maybe if I could just make this very concrete because it, listeners might not fully, or may, might not be aware of the details of these bills, but a good example of what Musa is describing could be an outcome from a bill being considered in New Hampshire. So the New Hampshire bill, like bills in West Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, would, uh, prohibit the promotion or endorsement by faculty of certain kinds of divisive concepts. There's a whole list of them. A divisive concept, for instance, that the state of New Hampshire um, is a sexist or racist state, or that the United States is, a, is, is inherently sexist or racist. Other kinds of divisive concepts, um, racial or sex-based or sex stereotyping 
for instance, that certain kinds of attributes, values, beliefs, character traits, um, are, or privileges or statuses are uh, possessed by someone on the basis of their, uh, their race or their sex. Now, I think that when the legislators are drafting these bills, they have in mind a very specific sort of example. And I'll, probably they imagine something like white privilege, right? The idea that all white people, by virtue of being white, possess a kind of special privilege or status. And that's the kind of claim that I imagine a lot of these legislators want to prohibit in the classroom. But as Musa points out, this could easily be interpreted in other ways. For instance, affirmative action. Let's suppose a law professor wants to defend affirmative action, wants to endorse the policy of affirmative action, a policy that an opponent of affirmative action could say, aha, that professor is endorsing the idea that we should treat people differently, afford them a different status or privilege based on their race. Or maybe a psychology professor wants to describe certain characteristics that he or she believes people have according to their sex, certain kinds of behaviors or character traits. It doesn't matter whether you or I or anybody else believe that, that sort of thing. The point is that that is a kind of speech that I think we all should want to be permissible in an academic context. But because it would involve attributing to someone based on their sex, a certain trait or, or uh, behavior, it could run afoul of this divisive concept uh, pro prohibition in these bills. Those are just off the top of my head, but you only need to be, you, you shouldn't approach these bills the way you, a, a rational sane person would. We should approach these bills the way the most paranoid member of a university's legal team would approach these bills, because they're the ones that will be deciding whether or not this class gets offered, whether or not this speaker gets invited, because they are will be acutely aware of how catastrophic it would be if the university was found to have breached these laws. There could be cuts in funding. There could be uh, uh, they could be barred from bidding on certain kinds of state contracts. Really severe penalties, and you need to put yourself in those that very paranoid position to understand how easily these bills could be abused. No, I think that's an excellent point. And it's very clear that that efforts to legislate in this fashion have these kind of, you know, just endless possible ramifications. And that's why they're so uh, dangerous and they're so worrisome. Um, you know, it, just imagine telling all the faculty at a university, you know, tell me anytime you say the word oppression in your class or privilege or what have you. And um, the notion that we would on, on the one hand be supporting liberal arts and you know debate in the classroom and open debate, open inquiry, free speech um, by somehow suggesting there are certain words that can't be said when context matters so much to what is being said. And some of the most dynamic professors are ones who think on their feet, who raise interesting examples on the fly, who bring in um, current events to connect to their students. So this I think has a significant potential to dampen and make everyone kind of think twice, makes education a lot more sterile. I also want to ask, and, and Lindsay, I'm, I'm thinking about this one for you a little bit. You know, I remember back to last summer when the George Floyd protests were happening and there was a, a hashtag black in the ivory that, you know, spread on Twitter and Facebook and unleashed all these stories of experiences with racism uh, in higher education. And I'm thinking also about the um, complications, tensions, challenges that we've seen recently surrounding student athletes, particularly black student athletes kneeling before um, games. And, you know, these are examples to me, uh, not of, you know, conservative ideas being censored or silenced or chilled on campuses, but, you know, progressive ideas. And so, you know, when, when you've been tracking these issues for some time, do you, you know, is, is your sense of this that, that the issues really are just about censoring of conservative ideas or not sufficient conservative representation on campus or is it more complicated? Yeah, it's, I think that's a great question. I think it's a couple of interconnected issues. Um, I mean, I think the first is that, you know, when you hear the word professor in a lot of cases, you think of a tenured academic who, you know, has all of the protection in the world to pursue the research search and the kind of teaching that he or she wants to do. And that simply on a lot of cases, on a lot of campuses just isn't the case anymore. Um, the job status of a lot of faculty members is far more precarious and, you know, can can be sort of at the whim of, of public outrage too. If, if, you know, someone says something that, 
generates a lot of controversy, either you know a liberal point of view or a conservative point of view. I think when you saw a lot of reaction to some of the the black and the ivory posts from over the summer and um, you know, in the separate sort of example, athletes and student students kneeling at um, the beginnings of games, um, I think it's important to recognize that the the emotional response to that type of demonstration, um, you know, isn't isn't quite protected and that there is a, a degree of risk that faculty members are taking on for speaking out in that way and that students are taking on in speaking out in that way. Um, you know, the structure of, of many institutions, you know, there's the board, of course, that in many cases is appointed by the legislature um, or confirmed by the legislature. That, that entity hires and fires the public college president. And so when there are um, controversies on campus, it doesn't necessarily just get blowback from the legislature. You know, I think it can also bring some internal political pressures as well on, on top campus leaders. So all of these sort of interconnecting dynamics make it so that simply speaking out, you know, whether it be on a particular issue that's important to you or on your own experience, that, that you could be assuming a degree of risk uh, while doing that. I mean, just, just in terms of the possible political pressures that you could see. Yeah, and if I can just double down on that, I mean, this is something that I have uh, firsthand experience with. Um, so before I was at Columbia, I was uh, an instructor at University of Arizona and following uh, one of these, uh, I had the privilege of being the focal point of one of these sort of Fox News witch hunts. And in the aftermath, uh, despite having glowing teaching evaluations and teaching a, a core course and all of this, my contract was just not renewed because a lot of these you know, you know, um, university leaders, um, if they think that they can make a mob go away by giving them a head, they'll just give them a head because they want peace on campus. They want to protect, you know, they, they want to uh, placate um, possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, donors or trustees who might be uh, annoyed or upset. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is the case, I mean, for contingent faculty, which are approaching 70% of faculty on uh, overall these days, um, academic freedom in many cases is like almost a joke. Um, and that's a, you know, and, and so you, there is a lot of risk involved. And one of the things um, that uh, Jeff has pointed out um, through some of his own work, he put together a database uh, to this effect, showing that when you look at the professors who are fired for political speech, um, a large number of them are on the left. I mean, um, per capita, it's more common on the right, but in terms of sheer numbers, uh, mo mo most of them are on the left. So we have a question in the Q&A, which I, I'd like to go to next, and then, um... I'm going to come back to some of the other solutions, but just to, to kind of round out the question of how we diagnose the problem. The question comes from Elizabeth Niehaus, who asks, what evidence do we have that there is actually a self-censorship problem on campus? I know there are a ton of surveys out there that people use to back up this claim, but generally the questions asked are problem really problematic and often don't tell us much about how students actually think about what to say or not to say in class. I think that is to say there is a great deal more nuance than perhaps is captured in some of the surveys which are uh, used a lot to make these claims. So Jeff, I know that you have, have you know, written a lot about these surveys. What evidence do, you, evidence do you see that you find convincing on this point? Or in other words, that you say, you know, the st state legislators indeed are responding to something that is real. Right. Well, first of all, I, I think very quickly you'll find that Musa is, is the real expert on this topic. But um, what I can say is that um, we do have surveys, um, as, as Elizabeth mentions, from organizations like Heterodox Academy, which releases annually its campus expression surveys. Uh, we have similar surveys from um, uh, uh, many organizations like the, the, the Knight Foundation uh, and many other organizations as well. Um, and, and really, their questions normally look something like this. They'll ask, um, have you ever uh, declined to express an opinion in the classroom or elsewhere on campus uh, because you were concerned how others might respond? And sometimes these surveys will offer a, a menu of possible motivations that you can choose from to explain why you declined to express yourself. 
Now, the thing about these surveys, and I think where the questioner is absolutely correct to, to kind of raise a red flag, is that some kinds of reasons for self-censorship are maybe not uh, you know, uh, something we should celebrate, but are, are deeply understandable and maybe just natural to any kind of social environment. Maybe you decline to speak because um, you don't know the answer to the question in the classroom. Maybe you decline to speak because you, wanna, you want to impress your friends, you don't want to appear stupid. As a, as a teacher myself, I struggle with students who won't open themselves up to the possibility of being wrong in public, but I think that's a very common characteristic, a common reason, and might be a bit different from what the state legislators are responding to. They're responding to a more partisan reason, um, and maybe a more pernicious reason to self-censor, self-censorship, because uh, as a conservative, you fear that your ideas are not valued and that you will not be valued personally for holding those ideas. And, uh, and it, it, that kind of, of fear, I think these surveys do sometimes succeed in, in picking up. Um, for instance, we know that conservatives and especially very conservative students self-censor at far higher rates, according to these, these uh, res their responses in the classroom than liberal students do. Now, everybody wants to be popular probably the same amount. So the popularity argument or the not knowing the answer explanation doesn't really work for explaining that gap. A more partisan kind of censorship does though. And I think that kind of gap and the fact as well that that gap tends to be most pronounced along certain hot topic issues like questions of race, questions of gender and sexuality, um, the fact that's most pronounced along those lines, I think does give us a bit of leeway to say that there is self-censorship taking place that we really should be concerned about. I think the legislators are not making up this problem, okay? The self-censorship problem is, is real. Um, we can have a really great discussion about the scope of it. I do think that these legislators sometimes err on the side of catastrophizing this problem, but there is something going on there. The issue, and the one that we're dealing with here, I think, is that laws cannot solve this problem, at least not without excessive uh, censorship of its own and lots of second order effects that might damage the very cause of free expression that these bills are ostensibly being in, uh, designed to, to protect. Yeah. And if uh, I could, oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You, you go first, Lindsay, and then I'll uh, um, If I could just add quickly, I mean, I think the you know, I, I was reporting specifically on that Georgia effort to see, you know, what classes and what course outcomes had oppression or privilege in the description. Um, the lawmaker told a local news outlet that he did that after a constituent complaint or a constituent question. Um, I think the, the sort of natural question that follows is, you know, one constituent raising a concern. I mean, certainly lawmakers need to be responsive to the communities that they serve, but it's the type of inquiry that then, you know, created this whole um, search process throughout the whole system, throughout every class. And so I think when, when folks raise questions about are the responses proportionate with the degree of question or the degree of concern, I think that's the sort of dynamic that they have in mind. Uh, one thing that I'll just add is, um, okay, so one about measuring self-censorship is that one challenge, of course, with measuring self-censorship, it's similar to measuring um, censorship. So like, so, is that you're trying to measure things that were not, that were never put in the public, right? <laughs> so you're, you're trying to measure an absence, um, which is, uh, you know, it's the same when you look at, um, when you're trying to decide if there's publication bias in, um, you know, uh, the, you have to look, you're, you're trying to measure um, papers that were submitted but never published and why they weren't published, right? Um, so, so it's so it's measuring an absence um, uh, sort of challenging intrinsically. Uh, but uh, as Jeff noted, um, and one thing that's critical is for with regards to any kind of surveyor. No one should ever read one survey and uh, and overinterpret what it means or, or think it's reliable, you know, super reliable. Because you can poke holes in 
any, any survey or question has problems and limitations with respect to the questions it's trying to answer. But one thing that you do notice um, that, that I think Jeff did a great job of pointing out is that um, there are a whole bunch of these surveys conducted by a whole bunch of people um, and we're increasingly getting longitudinal data as they've been you know, asking them year to year to year. And what you see is you see uh, systematic variance um, between different groups that's persistent over time. And that's consistent in a range of surveys and in a range of questions that aren't asked the exact same way and things like that. And so when you see that kind of a pattern, that kind of robust pattern, um, then you have reason to think that there's a there there. Um, and, uh, and I'll add in addition to the sort of survey based um, investigations into this um, problem, there are also um, more ethnographic research projects that have found the same thing. So again, the book Passing on the Right is about conservative faculty members who self-censor and why. Um, there's great work by a sociologist, uh, Amy Binder, who also um, studied student groups, uh, political student groups around the country and um, did a lot of sort of ethnographically oriented research about a lot of these questions. So, um, so it's not even just a thing that's um, uh, captured in sort of polling, although Polling is the thing that people talk about most because you know the media, politicians, everyone, they love numbers. If you can say such and such percent of you know, whatever, people love that. So, so polling is where the conversation happens a lot, but it's not the only place that it's captured. And then the last thing I'll say is to, to, to double down on, on a point that Jeff made about why self-censorship is a problem, especially for uh, self-censorship among students in the classroom, for instance, is because um, Because you know, um, if you if you people yes, it's it's like one a critical skill that students need is the, is the comfort with being wrong and learning from mistakes. And if if people are unwilling to do this, if they think it's catastrophic to be wrong, and, and um, that in itself is a problem. It's not setting them up well for sort of future life stuff. Um, but then there's there's also um, important pedagogical costs, right? Because it's not like if they don't ask that question. They somehow get the right answer to the question. They just persist in error, um, and other students who who maybe share that error also, you know, lose the opportunity to learn from. Right. Um, so it's it's an important pedagogical problem, the self censorship, um, and uh, yeah, that's I'll leave it there. I think let's come back to the bills here uh, at this point, but I I will say just one thing, which is in my mind, you know, we're living in a time where it's actually. You know, there's a lot of movement in how people identify politically. There's a broad range. There's a lot of infighting on both what we might consider the left and the right. And so a lot of these polls and surveys, I think, do, you know, they can tend to be um, imperfect at uh, or, or kind of they tend to be tools of feeding more polarization and caricature of, you know, people and their political leanings. I think actually some of the stuff that Amy Binder's work and others has revealed is, is some of the nuance and complexity that, you know, it wasn't like every conservative on campus was cheering Milo necessarily, you know, there's a lot more gray area in, in, in a lot of these things. And I do worry sometimes that, that, you know, that, as just as you're saying, that hunger and thirst and, and affection for numbers does tend to, you know, give us a feeling that we're looking at something that's quite static and simple to describe when it is indeed so complicated. Um, so turning to the bills here, you know, putting aside, you know, whatever, whether the, the extent of the problem is, is, you know, open to some debate, but um, which of the bills are, have been enacted? At this point, I don't believe any, though they are moving in a few places, um, and which ones are most likely to be enacted in the near future? Jeff, you've been monitoring these most closely, I think. Uh, well, I can't speak to, to, to how closely, uh, I think Lindsay's been following them very closely as well. I guess what I'll say is some bills that were flagged at the start of this legislative session have already failed. Uh, so for instance, I believe um, Arkansas had a 1619 project ban that failed. Uh, South Dakota had one, it was withdrawn by its sponsor. Um, so some of these bills have already been removed from, from, from the calendar. Uh, other bills like New Hampshire's bill that would prohibit divisive concepts, it has advanced out of its committee, but the uh, governor, Governor Sununu, has already announced he would not sign it. So it, it seems unlikely that that bill is going to go anywhere. Um, other bills, though, are very much live and very much on the table. Um, Iowa is kind of a clearinghouse for these sorts of bills, and there's real momentum in its legislative chambers. Uh, 
to get these bills signed. So for instance, Iowa has a 1619 project ban that um, would prohibit uh, universities and public universities and colleges from making use in their history curriculum or any other curriculum of, uh, of any part in whole or in part the 1619 project. Any that mention. Is, what's any, any, like any, any discussion of it, right? Well, I, I, I don't want to get the language wrong. It's, it's, I, I'm, the bill is not designed to prohibit students from, or professors from acknowledging its existence. Rather, it's, it's meant to prohibit history faculty or history classes from making use of the 1619 project in whole or in part in their curriculum. Um, and, and of course, you know, there, there's a lot in that project. You know, uh, it, it would be very, very easy, I think, for uh, a student looking to claim a faculty scalp or a legislator with the same motivation to point to something in, uh, you know, well-accepted body of scholarly literature that uh, can be attributed to the 1619 project and get a, a professor in hot water. Um, and then uh, Iowa is also moving ahead with with one issue we have not talked about that's uh, that's related. Um, and that is a bill to ban tenure in the states. I, I think I don't quite know exactly what the status is of it this this week, but this ban, this this revocation of tenure, has been tossed around in Iowa multiple sessions now, and it peters out. Um, it has a lot of momentum this year, and there are a lot of legislators who are talking about it, talking this bill up and and describing it. Um, I think the, li the, the word that the expression that was used is it was a live grenade this session. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, Iowa is a place where I think if you want to see the cutting edge innovations in the area of regulating faculty speech or reining in uh, quote unquote left wing academics, Iowa is the place to look. And that, and that tenure um, legislation or that, that bill um, you know, in conversations in state chambers, it is explicitly tied to this issue. I mean, college leaders there are seeing complaints about um, the political leanings of professors and on free speech issues. And so that is, you know, stock and trade part of the conversation when lawmakers there are trying to revoke uh, tenure. And, you know, in Iowa, it stems from this controversy surrounding the dentistry school. Uh, most recently. So, you know, it often starts in these kind of sensationalized stories. You know, I used to say to people um, uh, when I still travel to universities, you know, trying to explain how complicated and large these things are as entities. You know, the notion, we don't tend to think of universities like cities that, that have a mayor, you know, and nobody really knows what's happening to them. Um, but but the, the it's sort of all it takes is one little um, one thing, and you know, it's not to say that what happened in the dentistry school there was little or, or not significant. I do think that um, you know the conservative student in that case probably you know surely didn't deserve to be silenced or censored in the way that they were. But the question is like, is that one experience something from which you know we really need to get rid of tenure as a result? Um, um, it seems pretty extreme as a response. Well, and of course. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's actually almost the exact opposite of what of the direction that people so, should go, right? So if, if the idea is you want people to feel more comfortable expressing views that other people disagree with, making it easier for them to lose their job if they make someone mad is like basically the worst way to approach <laughs> that problem, right? Um, and... Uh, I mean, and, and, and this isn't, and it's not, and this kind of mentality about addressing this problem, I should add, isn't, isn't just restricted to the right. So for instance, Amy Wax made a lot of people angry. Uh, you know, there are all these movements. Um, Amy Wax, uh, her most recent, but uh, what was, <laughs> but what I argued in the Chronicle of Higher Education in the middle of that um, sort of scandal was, People were calling for Amy Wax to be fired or to make it easier for her to, um, or, you know, to move her. And this is the exact, again, this is the exact, um, it's getting the problem backwards. The problem isn't that Amy Wax has tenure and is protected. The problem is that so many other academics, in fact, most academics today don't have those same protections. If you want, if, if you want to make it so that people feel more comfortable expressing 
uh, again, controversial views and views one disagrees with. One, people need to defend. <laughs> one, people need to work about, uh, you know, be, again, focused on increasing things like protections and job security rather than eroding them. And then two, uh, people need to stand up for people who's, who they themselves disagree with, right? None of these things are... Academic things, none of them matter in a world where everyone is. The only time they matter is, is um, to, to protect people uh, who, we, who we disagree with, especially when there's strong disagreements. And so, you know, people who care about things like academic freedom should start by defending people that they themselves disagree with, who articulate views that they themselves loathe. Um, they should really be modeling, uh, uh, standing up for those people. Uh, anyway, I'll just leave it there for right now. And if I can just you know, kind of jump off that point, Jonathan, um, Musa is quite right that the, these bills, the bills that we're describing largely today are, have their origins among Republican legislators, but this is a bipartisan phenomenon. Both parties are trying to pass bills um, or initiate policies that will restrict uh, faculty speech or expression on campus. Um, there's a whole discussion we could have, for instance, about uh, the implications of how universities and campuses handle uh, hearings surrounding allegations of sexual assault that has been vigorously lit litigated back and forth between different kinds of guidances issued by the Trump administration versus the Obama and now Biden administration on this issue and how it impacts um, uh, expressive rights of, of, of students. Um, but then also, uh, you know, more immediately, this legislative session, like all, all other legislative se sessions recently, we've seen members of both parties initiate bills surrounding uh, trying to uh, regulate the expression of sentiment surrounding Israel. Um, we see this with uh, New York. Uh, the New York legislator, legislature introduced this past month a bill that would prohibit the use of student fees um, or faculty uh, or uh, at public universities and colleges, uh, faculty uh, using their research funds to join scholarly societies that engage in uh, support for BDS, the boycott divestment sanctions movement. Um, there, is, uh, there have been aggressive pushes in many state houses to have universities adopt um, and define anti-Semitism using the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism, which critics claim might uh, ca uh, prohibit the expression of certain kinds of opinions about Israel. Um, and I have no interest in this forum litigating whether or not this is uh, you know, the right way to think about anti-Semitism, but certainly what it does do is it is one more, in this case, bipartisan attempt to regulate the kinds of expressive um, uh, activities that faculty and students and even administrators engage in. I'm gonna invite anyone in the audience if you have any additional questions to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. We have another one coming in a minute, but I thought I would just put in the chat as well, a link to a conversation we did in this series uh, in December about free speech and adjunct faculty, where we talked about many of the issues that have come up today surrounding, um, well, the ease with which for adjunct faculty in particular are being dismissed from uh, campuses and the ways in which uh, across the political spectrum they can feel uh, silenced and censored. Um, so the question we have in the chat here dovetails with one I was going to ask you, Lindsay, uh, uh, that we pre prepped on our list. So I'm going to try and put them together. But the question is really pointing out that actually a lot of the bills, um, not only do they tend to outlaw, uh, you know, in an effort to ban ways in which people are introducing divisive ideas or talking about, you know, race and sex stereotyping, a lot of the bills also have these clauses that say that nothing in this bill uh, would prevent, you know, the dispassionate discussions of these things as academic topics. So they seem to have these backdoor or almost contradictory sets of language in them. So the question was, um, how do we get these interlocutors to recognize the, the importance of not being too charitable, or at least, you know, how do we, I think, uh, have some of these state legislators understand that the bills that they're putting forward are basically, you know, I don't know, so convoluted. Um, and, and my related question I had for you was actually to ask if you have the sense that really, you know, college leaders are really um, doing enough about this, paying enough attention to it, presidents and others, are they highly alarmed in Iowa? Are they paying attention in Arkansas? Or does this seem, you know, and, and could this 
be one area where they could be doing more to try and, I don't know, work with state legislators to, to try and influence these bills? Um, it's a great question. So I think it, you know, this is coming in um, the context of COVID and the context of the public health side of COVID and also the budgetary side of COVID. And that has totally consumed campuses, especially campus leaders for, I guess, you know, now 12 plus months now. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of short term practicality, a lot of college presidents, a lot of college boards, their eyes have been on that ball. And I think, you know, for, for good reason. Um, I think the question of, you know, are colleges ready to defend their, their operations or are campuses good enough at showing their worth to the entities that fund them? Um, that's been a conversation that many schools have been having for a number of years now um, when polls sort of started to show this very sharp divide um, on how conservatives and other right-leaning people were perceiving higher ed especially in red states, that was very much front of mind for the legislature, uh, for the boards as and presidents as they talked to the legislatures. Um, you know, you'd see campus leaders talking about um, research impact. You'd see them talking about, you know, the disparate outcomes in the economy for college grads and even people who have had some college versus people who don't go to these institutions. So. Certainly college leaders are used to defending themselves and sort of making their case for why they matter. Um, the question is really, you know, um, how, how that message will be received. Um, and I think the other sort of cultural context that we have now, um, and this has certainly waxed and waned for the last few years, but this, this sort of culture war um, that is, you know, sucking up a lot of the oxygen in, in many conversations. Um, you know, I think it's, it's natural and easy to take one thing that you've heard of on one college campus and fit it into a larger um, narrative about the state of free speech and, and campus culture. And so I think, um, you know, it's easy for these tensions to be inflamed and, and in this current moment. And that's another thing that, that we're seeing right now. Jeff, thoughts on college presidents and, and what is to be done about fighting these bills? Uh, I, I think, I mean, to be perfectly realistic, I think many of these bills will, will fail on their own. I think that, uh, they might, in some cases, they're making it out of committee and they're making it out of committee at, at a greater rate than I would like, certainly, but always on a party line vote. And once they are presented to chambers as a whole, um, I suspect many of them will fail. But I only say that because generally these bills, when they're passed, when they've been introduced in the past, don't make it all the way to a governor's desk for signature. That doesn't mean that things won't be different this time. In order to mobilize to address this problem, I think I, I would like to see greater journalistic scrutiny of these bills. Um, I'm not directing that at Lindsay, certainly, who has been on the ball from day one, but I think that there are many people who are vocal about uh, academic freedom and campus free speech, but generally they direct their fire at uh, threats to free speech coming from the left. Um, I think greater attention to these sorts of highly organized highly uh, serious legislative threats um, from journalists, from commentators, from the press would be very welcome. And then I would also, uh, I think this is where we need to, we also need to look to organizations like for instance, uh, PEN America or FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which provide legal advice or, or representation to faculty or to other members of campus communities um, in order to uh, you know, ensure that people's expressive freedoms are protected. Um, but uh, I think this is going to be a long-term fight. I, if, if these bills don't pass this year, um, they might get, you know, the, the momentum is there, it's building. And even if they don't pass, they send a message and it's a chilling one. And uh, even if they fail, uh, I think Presidents of universities are getting a message and it's um, avoid certain topics, avoid certain issues. Otherwise you might find yourself in front of the, the, Iowa, commit, the Iowa House Committee on uh, Education being yelled at 
uh, by uh, an angry legislator as actually happened uh, this, this past month as actually happened. And I think that point you make about momentum is so important here and, and, and instructive. Um, you know, a lot of these bills, uh, at least the anti-1619 bills are based on something that was written by Tom Cotton last year. And, um, you know, they've just, they were all introduced around the country with incredible speed. I think we're seeing similar uh, speed um, and I don't know if it's right to call it coordination that we saw behind previous rounds of campus free speech bills, certainly at play now um, that we're seeing in other kind of legislative efforts as well. Musa, I'm going to give you, you know, the last word here. I want to ask you, you know, you've seen, you, you know, we started out with your diagnosis of some of these challenges. Um, you say, you know, we need some kind of solutions, but also you're skeptical that these state legislative, you know, efforts are the right answers. What do you think are the right answers? What do you think people need to be doing uh, on campus to, to kind of improve the climate for free speech that isn't, you know, this? Yeah, well, that's a big, uh, that's a big question. Uh, okay, so one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll just note at the top is again, um, because the, the problem has actually several problems. Um, I, I, I think that there's, um, that similarly, the solution is gonna be sort of several solutions that are you know, different tactics to address different components of, of the challenge. Um, but uh, but what, what, what might some of those be? Um, so uh, for instance, um, for the, with respect to uh, the lack of, of um, viewpoint diversity in the classroom, like for instance, on syllabi or among professors, right? Um, one of the things that's important um, and that has been valuable is that when you, when you demonstrate to professors, uh, a lot of people, because, there's, because this conversation is happening in the context of this culture war, and uh, because some of the, a lot of the actors who are pushing these things seem flagrantly um, are uh, hypocritical, uh, don't seem particularly interested in research and teaching, et cetera. Um, it's created skepticism from a lot of people, justifiable skepticism about how severe these problems are, about why people are concerned about them. And what I found is that when you when you show when you walk people through a lot of the data, for instance, on um, on things like uh, studies that show bias in what gets published or not, um, what gets grants or not, things like institutional review boards, things like that. Um, uh, it helps. It helps people understand, and when they understand, they can do practical. Uh, when they understand, one that there is this sort of uh, that there that these problems are real and not not just right wing talking points, um, and two, um, that there are things that 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 action needs to be had on it because right now, uh, people in higher ed do have some say and what we do about these problems and how we address them. But if they go too long unaddressed, eventually it will genuinely be out of our hands, right? Um, these, these kinds of bills and heavy handed, ham fisted things will eventually probably get through. So right now, when we have time to kind of think through this ourselves and to make changes ourselves that are resonant with the, with the values of our institutions, with the needs and priorities of our institutions that are mindful of the different purposes of our institutions and the different constituencies we're trying to serve, right? Um, we should we should really be putting a lot of energy into that. Some practical things people can do. Um, so, for instance, uh, professors oftentimes say, "You know what? I would love to talk about conservative thought more in my courses, but I'm not a conservative. I have no idea even where to begin on this. Uh, like, who would I put on my on my uh, syllabus on racial inequality? Who's a conservative?" And who's not crazy, um, <laughs> and um, and they don't even know where to begin. Uh, and so organizations like, um, and so this is the thing. Like at Heterodox Academy, one thing that they're trying to do right now, I know, is for instance, um, create a, create a repository of model syllabi. So if you're someone who has done classes on different topics um, that and you've tried it and it's worked well, um, you know, uh, and putting that resource up there so that other people who want to do this kind of thing have somewhere to look. Um, so that kind of collaboration across faculty is, is helpful. Um, again, I think it's important for people to model um, these values themselves. Uh, so, you know, it's all, it's all well and good to, 
to, to point out Republican hypocrisy on things like free speech and, and all of that. But, you know, we have to model these values ourselves by, by again, standing up for people whose, whose views we find repugnant and repellent rather than going, oh, man, you know, these, these people on the right are trying to fire people all the time with these Fox News witch hunts. Oh, but Amy Wax, she's gone or, you know, <laughs> et cetera, right? We need to be consistent and we need to defend the people that we find repugnant um, and, and, and horrendous too. Um, uh, um, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, and the precarity thing is, is a, I mean, I, I think that there needs, uh, addressing the precarity uh, within institutions of higher learning is probably the single, you know, one of the, the single most important things that we can do. Um, how to address that is uh, complicated. Part of it relates to the overproduction of PhDs in some fields. Part of it relates to the sort of, uh, again, the financial uh, for structural decisions within these institutions that are outside of the capacity of, of faculty by themselves. But this is a case where faculty need to organize, faculty need to show solidarity, um, tenured and tenure track faculty need to show solidarity with contingent faculty um, to push back against some of these things that are outside of their own control. Um, yeah, anyway, it's a big question. So uh, I apologize if I've been kind of, uh, but yeah. More solidarity. That's what we need. More solidarity, more seizing the day. And and I do appreciate your point about taking action um, before, you know, to, to, to recognize that the that higher education is doing something and is doing many things to address these challenges and perhaps doing more to make legislators and the public aware of uh, the initiatives that are underway. Uh, Musa, Jeff, Lindsay, thank you so much for being here with us today and talking about these issues. Uh, we'll definitely be continuing to monitor them and uh, looking to uh, all of you to help keep us informed. Um, thank you to our audience for joining as well. Please stick with us next Friday at noon, 12 ET. We'll be talking with uh, leaders of some of the Association of American, Coll American Colleges and Universities, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Centers. We'll be talking about race, reconciliation and free speech on campus in the post-Trump era. So please join us then. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Having us. Great conversation.